Thomas, thank you very much for joining me. You're a writer with, for many places, including New York Times Magazine, Harper's, and you've also written a book called Unlearning Race. And I'd love to talk to you about kind of the current cultural situation. And also, I think maybe the place to start is that Unlearning Race Now, while you've got books like White Fragility at the top of the charts and How to Be an Anti-Racist, seems counter-cultural almost, or it's, it's, it's not the current um, understanding of what the, or where the discussion is at right now. What are you making of the, of the current kind of situation? The current situation is um, a complicated one. On the one hand, it is heartening to see such interest being paid to questions of how race is constructed, um, how it's enforced, imposed, how it governs our lives and our society. Um, this is all to the good. Um, but as you, yeah, as you point out, the, 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 the main books, the texts that are being quoted and cited everywhere are texts that um, I do take issue with because they in many ways reinscribe um, ideas of racial essentialism that my book is arguing against and that I'm trying to um, get the conversation to look past. So you have a book like White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, which is the big bestseller right now. And uh, it's problematic in certain ways because it, it presents white people as an undifferentiated mass, uh, not as individuals with agency. And it presents blacks in a way that's quite troubling to me as kind of like um, an undifferentiated mass of, um, of people who are fundamentally oppressed and can only ever react to the real agents of history who are, who are, who are whites, who are also paradoxically not individuals. And then on the other hand, you have Ibram uh, Kendi and some others who, um, you know, they make very persuasive and good calls for, um, for anti-racism, but they kind of enforce another kind of essentialism that sees people as fundamentally black and fundamentally white. And my argument is, um, is not necessarily at odds with uh, Kendi's How to Be an, uh, an Anti-Racist, but it doesn't stop at the uh, notion that you have to be an anti-racist. I think we have to do two things at the same time. We have to, on the one hand, fight racism, which is real and which governs um, our lives. But we also have to always keep our eye on the ultimate objective, which would be to do away with the categories of race that uh, racism imposes. I start from the premise that racism creates race and not the other way around. Yeah, I think, as you're saying, like you have to balance these things at the same time. That seems to be a very difficult conversation to have right now because it's very nuanced. For example, um, Brett Weinstein put out a piece talking about, he, he's an evolutionary biologist and said that talking about race is very, can be very dangerous because it essentially triggers some very deep evolutionary drives. It enforces tribalism. So how can you have that conversation while at the same time recognizing that there is deep rooted inequality, there are legacies of oppression and holding the, both of those at the same time, but not reimposing kind of these essential categories. Like that feels like a very delicate balancing act. It is quite a delicate balancing, balancing act. And I think that Part of the thing that we're seeing now is that not everybody is necessarily interested in um, making the effort to balance. So part of what has to happen is that people have to um, come as good faith interlocutors into the exchange. Um, there is quite, you know, there, I'm not, I wouldn't say that that's not out there, but it seems to me that there's kind of less of an appetite for that now than there was certainly um, in 2008 when the nation seemed to be like, in a good faith way, fundamentally inspired by the idea that maybe we could transcend this kind of um, uh, historical sin that defines our country. And of course, you know, that kind of euphoria was very short lived and we soon saw the limits of um, the symbolic victory of having a, a, a mixed race black man, and I put mixed race in quotes, uh, at the helm of the government. Um, and now it seems that the, that the disappointment was such that, um, there's less and less of a generosity and willingness uh, for people even on the left to, to give up these categories. I feel like um, oftentimes it's a very lonely place to be saying that the ultimate goal still has to be to transcend racial categories because they don't biologically exist in meaningful ways. That's not something that everybody agrees with anymore. And I remember very well in 2008, that would be something that people would say was the ultimate goal. So 
it's tricky. And, uh, you know, and some of it has to do with the fact that um, they're making inroads. People are making progress by um, reifying these categories, by, by doubling down on them. It's, 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 it's working. It's getting, um, it's getting people to concede quite a lot. So it's tough to tell people that this thing that's working in a pragmatic sense is something that doesn't work in a philosophical or maybe even moral or ethical sense, and you should actually give it up or might have long-term consequences that are going to be um, right. dangerous. That um, some of these victories and gains might be pyrrhic in nature, yeah. I'm interested in your journey through this. Like, how did you become particularly interested and how, where have you ended up in your kind of explorations of this topic? So my journey on race has um, always been somewhat out of the mainstream because I'm 39 years old. I was born in 1981. Um, I'm the son of a black man from the segregated South. My father's actually from Galveston, Texas. It's uh, June 19th today, which is Juneteenth, which is the um, traditional holiday uh, because slaves in Galveston were freed about two years uh, after everybody else. And so when they got the news that they were freed, uh, they, they ran into the streets and rejoiced. That's Juneteenth. Um, so my, my father comes from that world. He was born in 1937, um, fully became an adult before civil rights. Um, my mother's a white woman from San Diego, California, and my brother and I were raised in um, what looks to others as a multiracial family, but we were raised by both of our parents um, as though we were a black family. My mother was white, but we were not raised as biracial. We were, um, we were regarded as black by the black kids and the white kids that we uh, knew, and our parents raised us to be black, and we accepted that. And it wasn't a very complicated relationship to identity that I grew up with uh, in New Jersey. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, when I married um, a white woman from France, moved to Paris, and um, found myself more and more in conversations where I was trying to explain the logic of the one drop rule, which governed my own sense of self back in the States, but which Europeans don't necessarily um, assume and aren't necessarily even familiar with. So when people would ask me, you know, in France, the question is often, what are your origins? And that means, because the French don't necessarily speak about race as such, that means, what are you? And so I would say I'm black and that would often draw a kind of surprise that it doesn't draw back in the States. And then I'd get into these conversations and I found myself um, defending this logic of hypo descent and the one drop rule, which is really um, the logic of the plantation. And, and, and I found myself less and less convinced by it the more I spent time out of the United States. Um, but I couldn't quite get myself to give up on it in 2012. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times uh, arguing that no matter what my wife, uh, my wife and my children would look like, uh, they would be black because black is a is a choice and it's a discipline and it's a kind of uh, it's it, it's a moral stance. Um, and I kind of really realized that I was writing that op-ed to convince an audience of one, which was myself. It was difficult for me to break with this kind of construction constructed identity that. Um, that had always been just my reflexive understanding of myself. But when my daughter Marlo was actually born in 2013, um, her physical presence in my life uh, suddenly thrust what I guess I would call the fiction of race before me in a way that my own mixed background never had. And it wasn't the realization that I here I had a white daughter with blonde hair and blue eyes and, and white skin. It was that I fundamentally don't believe that you can be a different race than your child or that you can be a different race than your parent. Um, I didn't see a white child there. I just saw, if I can have a daughter like this, what does, what does it even mean for me to be a black man? And what does it mean for her to be walking into the world presumed to be white if she can be directly descended from black slaves? So then that began, began the process of what became the book, uh, Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race. Yeah, I, I wonder whether it's also a generational thing because I, I was brought up by very um, racially aware, anti-racist left-wing parents. And I can remember back then, I I'm confused. Like I, I, I don't really understand the world we're in now because it seems that, I, I, for example, I remember being brought up um, and being told why the word colored was no longer okay. This is in the, in the 1980s. And now we've kind of ended up in this place where people of color seems to be 
the accepted definition. And I remembered, like, even as, a, even as an eight or nine or 10 year old, understanding, or at least I thought I understood at the time, that it was inherently othering to have a word that sort of meant them and us. And yeah. now suddenly we've, we've ended up in this place where there seems to be another kind of, I, 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 I'm, I'm confused. And I think a lot of people, um, kind of white liberals like myself feel very, um, yeah, unsure and, and, and quite scared in some ways to say certain things now, because there are certain, it seems that, that there is a, a certain, there is a certain set of actions and a certain set of, ways of talking about this that is the accepted wisdom rather than um, what I what I used to understand as kind of being anti-racist. There's the accepted wisdom, but it, that accepted, accepted wisdom is also uh, rapidly shifting all the time. So you're constantly having to rearrange the way you think about language and the way you think about referring to other groups of people. People of color uh, is a term that really bothers me on several levels. First of all, it's extraordinarily imprecise. Nine tenths of the world um, or more fits into that definition because only a tiny fraction of humanity uh, is European or European descended. Um, and it seems to take this nine tenths of humanity and define them as like solely um, having this thing in common, which is their mistreatment by white people. That's the only thing that would link um, a Latina, a black person, a Chinese person in, in the American discourse that seeks to put them together as people of color. So it's, 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 it's a way, it's a kind of back door right back into white supremacy um, by other means. If, if, if you think about it for even a second, it still, it, it, it separates people into whites and non-whites and the relation is one of domination and hierarchy and that's what i'm trying to get past but the language itself um the the, the terms are are shifting i mean just this week the conversation is about um now more and more publications will be pub will be capitalizing the letter b in black but will not be um capitalizing white so every group will be capitalized but only one group will not be capitalized and that will be white people who will understand that they are still um, the center of everybody else's drama and story. Yeah, that they're the default in some ways. Yes. I've seen even in the last two weeks, a lot of friends on Facebook, for example, posting P POC, POC, mm -hmm. and asking questions like, does anyone know any good POC facilitators? Yes. And it's, for me, that feels incredibly dehumanizing. So to see this language come in full force in the last couple of weeks in a way that for me feels, de I, I would never use it because I feel that is dehumanizing. To call someone a POC, for me is, is, is really, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm in this strange world. I see this sort of strange world growing around me and I don't, I don't know how to navigate it. I'm, I'm confused. Well, I you're feel not scared. Alone. Of, you're not yeah. alone there, but you know, it's dehumanizing also to think that um, my view is only valuable or wanted or necessary because I'm a POC. Um, the world that I want to create and that we were supposed to be moving towards is a world where views are valid or not valid um, based on their intrinsic merit, that all people are welcome and not discriminated against based on their characteristics beyond their control, and that this is how we kind of uh, like orient the public sphere. But the idea, you know, my wife sent me um, a tweet yesterday that was a screenshot of a, of a, of a restaurant owner's email. She had been um, contacted for an interview with a newspaper and her response was, we're an all white owned um, establishment. And so my, my new policy is that I need to know if you are also interviewing POC restaurant owners. And if not, then I wanna give up my slot in the article so you can talk to a POC. It seems on the one hand like what she's doing is generous and correcting a kind of exclusion that's going on. But if you stop to think about it for even a second, this is this is crazy. And it's it's reinscribing a racial essentialism. It has nothing to do with the restaurant. Just go out and find a POC. It doesn't matter what the person is. It doesn't matter if the person's uh, Laotian. It doesn't matter if the person's Filipino. It doesn't matter if they're Latina. This is all interchangeable. Mm. I'm a white person. I have privilege. So let me give up my seat to anybody regardless of what they have to say or if it's even relevant to your story. 
And so I, 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 just the idea that what we're doing, what, the world that we're in the process of hastily creating is one that reinscribes race as the only category that matters and that cannot be transcended uh, is a dangerous place to be going back to, regardless of whether we're there uh, from malicious intent or uh, from well-meaning um, stumbles that we're making along the way. And it's, and it's worse than that because it's not just a world where race is primary it's also that a certain particular type of of opinion within that category is primary as well like well, you say right. it's that's not what i was trying to say but the, the yeah. minority within the minority is deracinated you're not actually uh, you're an artificial indian or an artificial black man if you don't you're an artificial gay man if you don't uh pete buddha judge for example um was called actually the first straight gay candidate for president because he wasn't an authentic gay man because his views disqualified him from having that voice. We've seen um, Ayanna Presley, uh, the representative uh, member of the squad with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilan Omar. She talked about, we no longer want to have black and brown faces without black and brown voices. This gets dangerous. This, this, this is how you quash um, healthy disagreement and this is how you quash um, and squash uh, the ability for people to, uh, to challenge um, orthodoxies that may or may not be actually held by the majority of whatever group you're claiming to speak on, speak on behalf of. Yeah, and I've not spoken publicly on any of these topics before, but I was listening to the, the Sam Harris podcast the other day, and I thought he made a really good point, which was, I could have got on Glenn Lowry to talk about this. I could have got on Coleman Hughes. I'm really interested in talking to you because you've got a background in thinking very hard about these issues to explore in conversation with. But the idea that we can't talk about certain things if we're not from that background is part, seems to be part of the, the problem. Well, absolutely. That's how you, um, you preclude the possibility of dialogue. That's what the, the, the idea that um, there's what Glenn Lowry calls and what I, I'm very... Um, convinced is a real problem in today's discourse is this idea of identity epistemology. Um, that because I am black, I have access to some kind of knowledge that you can never possess. So the only thing that you can do is you can be quiet and listen and be an ally. Um, but the only way that you can, the only authentic allyship is silence. Th that's not, you, we all know that that can't possibly hold, that can't work. That's, that's, that's not how you build a multi-ethnic society that works. And you know, there's a backlash there, like we talked in the beginning of unforeseen consequences to short-term power grabs. Um, this is partially, I don't wanna say it's the only reason, but this is partially how we did end up with someone like Trump uh, resonating so widely. Um, we're creating a society where everybody has uh, an identity that gives them um, a, a knowledge and a morality. We're moving towards identity morality, identity ethics. So everybody can be proud of their identity and it gives them some special insight into the human condition, except for one group. And that one group is the, the group that's historically been in power and that is aware that it's demographically shrinking. And so what does that set up? That sets up um, a situation where that group is gonna, some of members of that group are gonna fight like hell to, to react in the worst possible ways to this new world that, that clearly singles them out and punishes them. So this is where we are in this horrifically polarized society with, 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 with Donald Trump as our president representing this embattled uh, soon-to-be minority. Yeah, and I'd be really interested in your thoughts on this topic as a writer, because that type of kind of epistemology seems to be the death of art, primarily because it's the death of empathy, it's the death of, like I, I, I know that you were heavily influenced by hip hop culture growing up, as was I, some of my favorite albums of all time, Most Deaths, Black on Both Sides. Just listening Kendrick. to that today. Oh wow, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, Ke Kendrick Lamar, I, I was obsessed with Kendrick Lamar from kind of um, Good Kid, Mad City onwards. F for me, those kind of artists, and the, the way they talk about the black experience and also the, the kind of the liberation of the black experience, that's, that's of huge value to humanity. That's, that's of, of huge value to all of us. Um, and this sort of sense of, this sense of epistemology that kind of ties into like the whole idea of cultural appropriation just seems like 
it walls us off from each other in a way that seems incredibly dangerous and damaging. Well, absolutely. I mean, the way that we've made such gains, you could argue, is through the, I mean, I have criticisms of what the representation of authentic blackness through hip hop culture, through the mainstream hip hop culture that was sold to us in the 90s and early 2000s. I have criticisms of what that did to the image that we bought of ourselves. But also, it'd be impossible to argue that the world's embrace of hip hop music and culture hasn't done as much or more to humanize blacks uh, in the eyes of, uh, of, of the rest of the world. That's done more, that and some professional sports have, have done an enormous amount of work that even the civil rights movement couldn't fully attain. It made people fall in love with uh, the culture and the people um, who made it. So art is, has a way of communicating that politics never can, that, that, that polemics never can, that, that you know, you can make, you can, you can read a, a novel and have an understanding of something going on that you just won't get from an op-ed, uh, no matter what. So the idea that now we're shutting that down, I mean, there was just this argument that um, this part Puerto Rican woman who wrote American Dirt, which Oprah's book club picked uh, last fall, this big bestseller that dealt with like an important moral issue of our time, which is, you know, immigration on the Southern border, this woman wrote a novel about it and she brought a huge amount of readers to this subject and readers who might not have approached the subject otherwise. And she was essentially dressed down and told that she couldn't do this. And I think that we're heading into a very dangerous place where everybody doesn't just not have access to the whole human story and access to each other's stories, but everybody can only write their own very narrow and specific story which is a way of segregating ideas and experiences. So I can only ever talk to you about um, my black uh, identity, but I can never talk to you about, um, apparently I can never talk to you about my love and knowledge of French literature or art or food culture. Um, it, I, I don't know if I have the right to wear the name Thomas Chatterton, who's, uh, who was a great poet from Bristol. Um, that's, that's not, do I have a claim to that? Am I supposed to be silent on that? We're getting into a dangerous place, but the, the way that it works in fact is that everybody actually can basically do things except for, except for again, white people. White people can't because there's some understood power relation in white people um, using other people's stories. So I, I think that what we have to do and what's difficult to do is just have principles and values that apply equally to everybody and not have these kinds of caveats that always try to seek to uh, address in very imprecise ways historical power imbalances. Because the problem with this type of correction is that we see all too often we're overcorrecting in ways that invite unforeseen consequences and that make it impossible to talk to each other and understand each other. Mm. I yeah, I wanted to return to what you just said about hip hop culture because that's what I love about Most Def. I'm, I remember his in, he's got a, a song called Hip Hop that I think is one of the greatest um, love kind of letters to the art. And he says in that, hip hop is prosecution evidence an out of court settlement ad space for liquor, <laughs> which is, so, so hip hop is also critical of itself. Like the greatest hip hop is also self-reflective and critical and, um, and the other side of it as well that I find very disconcerting with the current, a lot of the current dynamics is that it makes, and another most deaf line um, where he talks about in, invisible man got the whole world watching. <laughs> like black culture has been probably the driving force of American culture and American from Elvis Presley onwards and how much it's been kind of <laughs> appropriated. Jazz, yeah. yeah, how much it was appropriated by, by, by white uh, artists as well. But, but it, it's so intertwined with, with how we think of America and the driving force of America, probably one of the, the main driving forces of America. And what seems very disturbing about the current framing of only seeing black people as, as victims seems to a, a exclude that. And actually, like there's so much to be um, inspired by, proud of, um, and amazed by in, 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 that, in black culture. I agree 100%. I mean, that's the kind of black Southern tradition my father comes from and that seems very normal and natural to me. Um, you don't think of yourself as a victim. Um, this is a 
group of people, you know, Ralph Ellison called blackness a kind of discipline. And that resonates with me very uh, deeply. Uh, I've always been very proud to be, um, I guess, part of a culture and a tradition that, um, that achieved extraordinary um, artistic and, 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 and global contributions that survived, that didn't just survive, but survived with a blues sensibility that was a kind of stoicism and a kind of uh, taking the worst that life gave you and flipping it with a little bit of style and a little bit of swag and turning it into something that actually, yeah, people sitting in Paris wanted to hear Louis Armstrong. He's taking American pain and flipping it. Um, this is something to be proud of. And there's no people in the world that doesn't have a history of pain and exploitation. It depends at what point in time you catch them in this, you know, in, in, the, in the struggle. But I've always been proud to be black. I've never seen it as something that was akin to a disability, which is the way, and I don't mean to, I, I have to actually, I, I don't want to get in trouble for saying something that sounds ableist or anything like that. I simply mean that I never thought of being black as something other than a form of strength and discipline and a way of understanding America that maybe gave me access to um, a truth about America. James Baldwin has spoken and written very eloquently about there being something quite monstrous about getting to the age of 40 and never having actually known pain and never having actually lost something and never having struggled. And then, and then something happens to you later in life and you can't take it and you, this is how he described a certain type of uh, whiteness that operates in society, you know, a certain type of innocence. And I never wanted that or aspired to that. So I, I have a tough time with the privilege conversation because I don't think that some of the insights into human life and nature that coming up in a black tradition exposed me to, I don't think of that as being, um, as lacking in privilege. In fact, I think of that as something that's helped me um, grow to almost the age of 40 uh, in a way that I'm, that I'm, that I'm proud of. And, and how do you hold that tension? Because you, your book's called Unlearning Race, but you're, we're also talking about the value of black culture, black America as a distinct thing in itself. This, is there not a paradox there? I don't think so. I think that it's, you can vary, and a lot of people when they, when a lot of, sometimes I give talks and um, I see that some, people in the audience who define themselves as black, they, they're open to the idea of moving past race, but it hurts a little bit to think of severing ties with uh, a group of people they want to express solidarity with, which is something completely understandable. But I think it's very different to say race isn't real. There's nothing about blood and skin that we're talking about. We're talking about belonging to a community of people, a tradition, um, a certain region, regionalism matters, you know, being black in America is not the same as being quote unquote black in Jamaica or, you know, anywhere else. Uh, so you can belong to these people, but we also have to find different ways of belonging to uh, people who don't come from this community or tradition. We have to rethink what makes us Americans, what makes us humans, what makes us um, citizens of the 21st century. I think that holding on to blackness, um, as a culture is, is, is as healthy as holding on to Italianness as a culture or Jewishness as a, as a religion and a culture, but, it, but, but, the, but, but we're all, and it almost gets to the point where people would laugh at you for pointing this out, but what we are is we're members of the human race. I mean, you have to have both a more general understanding of yourself. We're just members of the human race and a much more specific understanding of yourself. I'm a British guy from Yorkshire or, or I'm, I might, you know, my, my mother's side comes from, uh, from Vienna and my father's side comes from Sicily. That, that's, that's where my people come from. The, but before that, they came from another place. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a big, it, it, it's actually hard to ask people to speak about themselves this way because we want these kind of easy uh, monolithic uh, color labels to slap onto extremely uh, diverse experiences and just to make it easy for us to categorize ourselves. But I think that we have to achieve a perspective that goes beyond that. If we're ever going to get past this kind of balkanized uh, debate that, that, that's, that's paralyzing our, our society. And I, when I was sort of doing a little bit of research before this conversation, um, I read an article in the New York Review of Books where you were uh, put together with 
I think people like Glenn Lowry, um, John McWhorter, and described as black conservatives, which didn't seem, which which didn't seem right. I'm, I'll, I'll get your reaction to that. Um, Los Angeles Review of Books, right? The yeah, the, uh, the LARB. Mm -hmm. What what do you make of that characterization? I mean, it's it's lazy. It, it it bothers me because I define myself as a liberal, have always certainly voted that way find no home uh, in the Republican Party whatsoever. Um, perhaps um, if the writer was implying that there are elements of cultural conservatism in, in there, maybe that's the case. Maybe, maybe I don't, um, I guess maybe, yeah, if, 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 if conserving elements of the past uh, make sense. Maybe he was implying that we're conservative in the way that Ralph Ellison can be called conservative, conservative personality or something like this. But um, it's also kind of slanderous and it's used as an epithet when, uh, when another black writer calls you a conservative. If you don't identify that way, it's a way of delegitimizing um, any kind of heterodox uh, aspects of your views that, um, that, that don't go with the kind of woke left or orthodoxy that carries the day right now. So it, it, yeah, it, it bothers me quite a bit. And as far as I'm aware, John McWhorter, Coleman Hughes, Glenn Lowry, any of those guys that I um, routinely get um, lumped with, none of them define themselves as conservative. I think only Glenn Lowry did in the 90s, but he since, you know, he redefined himself. So it's, yeah, it's just something that, you know, it's a, it's a label that I reject and I try to argue back against. Yeah, I mean, I was struck, like, it, 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 it struck me as very odd. I mean, it was, I, I would describe you all as heterodox thinkers, but certainly not conservative. And it felt like a way of kind of policing the conversation in yeah. terms of what views are allowed within kind of liberal, the, the liberal world and which, which are not. And I find that really, really interesting as a, as a phenomenon because there's this kind of paradox that only one particular perspective is allowed if you're from a certain minority group. And that, that seems essentialist at its core. That, the, the sort of yeah. paradox of, <laughs> that seems incredibly dehumanizing and a, and a real paradox of, of the way that the left can think about race at times. Yeah, and it's not just other so-called blacks who will level that at you. If you look, I don't know, I mean, the news cycle moves so fast, but recently Joe Biden in an interview with a black, uh, interlocutor um, made an off the cuff remark like um, the interviewer was asking him for more time to ask some more questions to go back to his community with to make the case for voting for Joe Biden. And Joe Biden's response was, well, you just tell them if you got to make up your mind about whether to vote for me or the other guy, you ain't really black. It's just it's mind blowing. It's extraordinarily patronizing and it kind of treats. Yeah, it treats. Uh, it, it makes an essentialism out of what should actually be um, something far more complicated. And of course, I understand that like, yeah, most black, nine out of 10 black people won't ever vote um, for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. I certainly won't even after he said that. But the idea that you must think a certain way in order to be authentically yourself as a, as a member of this community is really, um, I think it's destructive. But it's also concerning that on the other side, you have people like Candace Owens using that as a, as a way of divide, being more divisive. Like yeah. that, that in some ways is far more concerning when you see that kind of, um, that, that truth kind of weaponized on the other side as, in a very divisive way. You mean Candace Owens, somebody who's just sabotaging the conversation for her own personal gain? Yeah, but I mean, I see her being very, very divisive. I mean, she's, she has elements of truth in some of what she's saying, but she's using it in a very politic politically charged way to, to argue for um, black people to vote Trump, to vote Republican. Well, yeah, I just don't take someone like Candace Owens as a good faith um, conversation partner. So I think that it is very important to... Um, I think it's important to think through who is actually um, coming into the debate uh, in a good faith way. And so someone like Candace Owens, it's kind of a non-starter. She's done so much that's so sensational. It's kind of a non-starter. But um, to dismiss someone like who we've been talking about, like Glenn or, or John, 
um, as not authentically representing a black position because um, they diverge from the orthodoxy as something else altogether. I think it's really important, and, and that's what kind of the problem is with Candace Owens, because she inserts herself into the debate and then people can lump her with a guy who's a serious guy, like John McWhorter, and, and then, you know, it, the whole conversation breaks down. So why do you think things have shifted in this direction? What's your sense of why we've moved in this direction since 2008? I think that there is real profound and uh, in many ways justified disappointment with the limits of what actually happened. I think that certainly there's extraordinary um, disappointment with the idea that someone, no matter what your politics are, someone as elegant and as fundamentally, you know, trying to do what he believes is right, someone who was trying to unify the nation, somebody like Barack Obama could be followed by someone like Donald Trump who appeals to the most divisive aspects of the American discourse who really, um, it's an insult to follow Barack Obama by Donald Trump. And there's, there's really no way around that. So I think that that exacerbated things quite a bit. I think you can't talk about any of this without talking about the impact of social media on all of our lives and the kind of incentives, the dopamine driven incentives that, you know, drive our politics of, uh, of recrimination and, you know, that break us into warring tribes, following politics as a sport, um, the kind of self-righteous witch hunt that goes down to find somebody who's transgressed and then um, shame them on social media, you know, and then your kind of rediscovering your tribal identity makes me in turn rediscover mine and my tribal feelings intensify so we and, and we see everything all the time now and we're always in conversation about everything all the time so all of these factors come into play at the same time and i think that we're trying to figure out how to make um our cultures our societies our world work when we're exposed to each other and each other's flaws and each other's limitations um, more than we've ever been in the past Thomas, thank you very much. This is a really um, interesting conversation. I'm really, really glad that you agreed to do it. Oh, thanks for having me. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.